By the way, SCI lasts on average 10 years. So we have a tremendous opportunity. If everybody would simply come in and these two get on prevention or immediately when you have any symptoms, you wouldn't see much dementia. It would be the rare problem that it should be. With a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, it feels to me that there's a, a two-pronged approach. One, the preventative in the first place, where you can work with younger people to prevent these diseases from manifesting. But the far yes. bigger issue is how do we reverse or, or, or stop and then try to reverse in older patients where the, the disease has already taken effect. I want to look at kind of the lifestyle interventions that younger people can consider yes. in a second. But first, in terms of actually halting and then reversing these kind of diseases, you, you've been at the forefront of this. I was really hoping you could tell me a little bit about some of the successes you've had and where you hope the major breakthroughs are going to come in actually reversing this. So someone who maybe one day might have Alzheimer's, but then is clear of it in the way that you can go into remission from, from cancer or other illnesses. Absolutely. And it's been really striking. And you're right. I mean, we were the first to publish that back in 2014. We had another 100 patients we published in 2018. But of course, those are single cases. So, you know, even though it's 100 people, it doesn't give you a denominator. Uh, and so that's why we then did our proof of concept trial, which is freely available online. We published that last year and that was only 25 people, but 21 of them actually improved something that was unheard of before. And now we're in a larger randomized controlled trial at six different sites. So we're really excited about that. That's in Hollywood, Florida, Nashville, Tennessee, Cleveland, Ohio, and then Sacramento in California, Oakland, and San Francisco. Very excited about that. I'm working with some absolutely outstanding functional medicine physicians, uh, Craig Tanio and, and uh, uh, David Hasse and, and uh, Nate Bergman, Christine Burke, uh, and uh, Kat Toops uh, and Anne Hathaway. So very excited about that. So you're right. It, these are two different things. And absolutely, it is easier to do prevention. And I would go a, a step further. You go through four phases, we now know, with Alzheimer's. So you have an asymptomatic phase, which may last several years. And you can already show changes in people in their 20s and 30s on PET scans and spinal fluid. But these people are asymptomatic. But then the second phase is subjective cognitive impairment. You know there's something that's not right. You're not remembering phone numbers. You may have occasional problems when you're driving, but you're still able to score normally on cognitive testing. So by definition, that's SCI. The next stage in, by the way, SCI lasts on average 10 years. So we have a tremendous opportunity. If everybody would simply come in and these two, get on prevention or immediately when you have any symptoms, you wouldn't see much dementia. It would be the rare problem that it should be. The problem is everything is being done on these last two phases. The third phase out of four is called mild cognitive impairment. That was a terrible choice. It should never be called mild. It's a relatively late stage of Alzheimer's. It's like telling someone, don't worry, you've only got mildly metastatic cancer. Um, this is a late stage of the problem, and this is when the drug studies are done, MCI, and then full-blown dementia, as you mentioned. So what happens is we see the best outcomes in the early stages. We can make people better. The SCI people, pretty much 100% of them get better. The MCI people, as we showed in our trial, 84% we can make better, but it's harder, and they don't always get completely back to normal, whereas the SCIs typically come back completely normal. The dementia patients, some of them get better, and it's something like 30 or 40%, but it depends heavily on when you start. If you're starting, so let me give you what you mentioned. What about an example? Here's one from just a couple of days ago, and we've had thousands who have reversed their cognitive decline, and uh, actually we've published some of these. I wrote a book about it called The First Survivors of Alzheimer's. Seven of the people who got better wrote their own stories, and I have to say, if you can get through all seven of those stories without a tear, uh, then uh, you're an impressive guy because uh, the stories are amazing. These people who were told that, you know, you're going to die. One of the women, uh, her father was dying of Alzheimer's literally in the last stages when she was first diagnosed uh, or first had her, her abnormal studies. They hadn't given her a formal diagnosis yet, but she knew something's not right. And her mother, uh, her, her father's mother, her, her uh paternal grandmother had already died of Alzheimer's. And she also had ApoE4, the classic uh, uh, risk factor gene for all the most common risk factor gene for Alzheimer's. 
Uh, and she did great and has improved and has stayed improved. And it was great to see that. So it's really striking to see these stories. So one from just a few days ago, and this is, we're working with a wonderful health coach uh, in New York, who's Carrie Mills Rutland and her husband, Tim, and they interact with their patients, make sure they get the right things, get them to the right doctors. I go over some of the patients with her. They get appropriate reports. Now they're looking at larger data sets. It's not, again, it's not 20th century medicine where you look at tiny data sets and give a drug. It's 21st century medicine. You look at larger data sets and you have a network that you are dealing with. So this person actually came in with PCA, which is posterior cortical atrophy. That is one of the non-amnestic presentations of Alzheimer's disease. Not terribly common, but well-known, described by D. Frank Benson, the late, great uh, Dr. Benson, who was a professor at UCLA for, for many years. Um, and this was called Benson's syndrome. Uh, so you, people have problem because it's posterior cortical, they have problems with recognition of shapes and things like that. They often have vision problems, like, wait a minute, my vision, something's wrong. And it turns out, yes, it's really the, it's the interpretation of the vision. But they also then lose memory and ultimately die of Alzheimer's disease. So she scored only 16 out of 30 on the MOCA. So she was already into the dementia category. 19 to 22 is this is the overlap between MCI. Once you're you know down at 19, 18 and below, that's typically full on dementia. So her so she got on our protocol and it turned out she actually had multiple things. So she had recurrent outbreaks of herpes was one of the things. So she was treated with antivirals appropriately. She turned out to have Bartonella, which is a tick-borne illness, relatively common often goes undiagnosed. So she had to be treated for her Bartonella. And then she also had mycotoxin exposure. That's something that's not even recognized by the classical Alzheimer's foundations as being a cause, but it's a relatively common cause. So she was had to be, you know, had to be treated for all of those things, but also improved her gut function, also improved her, her insulin sensitivity. And then interestingly, she was already improving some. I asked Carrie, please consider adding EWOT, which is exercise with oxygen therapy, which supports better blood flow, better oxygenation. And boom, she really took off with that. Uh, and so her, you know, her uh, MOCA went back up to 21. Now 21 is not perfect yet, but her symptoms were just dramatically better. What was interesting is her MRI was dramatically better. So when you have PCA, because it's posterior, you typically lose some, you get some atrophy in your parietal and occipital lobes. Her parietal lobes were at less than one percentile for her age. So she had very significant atrophy fit perfectly with her presentation uh, in her parietal lobes. Now she had some temporal atrophy as well, which is less affected in these uh, PCA patients. So her temporal lobe went way up. And interestingly, her parietal lobe went from less than one percentile to the 23rd percentile for her age. I mean, that's just dramatic improvement. Uh, and with that, she noticed improvements. Her husband noticed improvements. Carrie noticed improvements. And of course, she scored better on her cognitive testing because the things that were actually driving the problem were identified and were addressed. So that's the future. And I think that, you know, again, I'd like to then be able to add targeted drugs. Uh, and the idea of removing amyloid as the only thing you're doing is a horrible idea. As again, Dr. Lee Hood says in his book, amyloid is an excellent biomarker because it's coming out when you've got these insults, but it's a lousy target for a drug because there are you want to go after the insults. You're not trying to go after the, your body's response. It's a little bit like if you take someone with leprosy. So imagine someone comes in with leprosy. And you say, wow, um, I've got a great drug that removes granulomas. Well, the granuloma is a response to the mycobacterium leprae that's giving you leprosy. So removing the granulomas is not the way to go.